Okay, so last week, Gary did an amazing job of kind of setting the stage for this. But I, I did, we did have a conversation about some of his comments. So he made the comment that something about these shortcomings with the Bible translations that we have today. And I just said to Gary, I think it's really important that we address that. Plus, then I get to give you some of the stuff that I've learned in the last while. So I get like stuff and you get to hear what the stuff I've been learning. So, yeah, I sound really, um, anyway. So, some of you are thinking, well, what's the point? Like, what's the point of, like, Bible study and what's the point of all the historical stuff? Maybe some of you are feeling like, hmm, I'm feeling a little insecure now about the Bible. If you're saying that some of the stuff we've been reading Maybe, let's say, an error with our translations, what can we trust and what can't we trust? So I'm going to address that today. Um, so the thing I've learned with Michael Heiser is to ask some really, like, ask questions, but let's ask some good questions. So a good question is, wh what do we really believe about what the Bible says? Because, you know, there is some weird stuff in there. And when the weird stuff hits, we're like, uh, I don't know how to deal with it, so let's just move on. <clears throat> Today isn't going to be like a preach. Today is more of a teaching, so bear with me. If you get bored, just pretend you're interested. Download the, the I'm really listening face, and internally you can be t like shut down. Okay, I don't mind. So what is it, like biblical theology, like what? What on earth? Why bother with Bible study? So there's a big difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible. Let's say there's a big difference between reading what the Bible says, as I said, is one thing, but getting what the Bible means is a totally other realm or idea. And that's what we're on about. What does the Bible mean? What do the authors want to convey? Not just reading the words. <clears throat> Can we trust any of the Bible translations today? And how accurate is the, our modern Bible translations verse, versus the, the ancient manuscripts? So this is kind of the questions. If they're floating around in your head, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good to ask those questions. Is it valid what we're reading in the Bible? Okay, so... This isn't a series that we're going to like, deconstruct the inerrancy. It's like, is there errors in the Bible? It's actually to gain clarity. So it's not about the errors or the fact that there is or isn't errors. It's about what clarity can we gain or more clarity can we gain about what the Bible is trying to convey. And the reason why these let's say, errors is because of we live in a modern world. We think with a m scientific m mindset. Those guys had no clue about science. We're going to have some really funny times when we discover what they believe about scientific stuff. But that's not the point. They, they weren't science people, so we can't expect them to, to write in a scientific... It's not a textbook, people. Thank goodness. All right, so he has an incredible... Quote. So I'm, I'm going to mention a few guys. If you want to start reading on, like, Lost World series by John Walton. Um, this one is written by John Walton and Brent Sandy. He's done Lost World of Genesis, the Lost World of Scripture. He's done a whole bunch. And sometimes if you, like, kind of troll a a Amazon, they sometimes have these books on special. Or like me, I was very lucky and I found them free. So... Just keep going there. You can get these books. I would encourage you to read them. They open up a beautiful world of when Scripture was written. So, we believe that the Bible deserves the highest possible honor as the richest, deepest, most powerful book ever written. There's simply no contenders, and I'm going to prove to you today that. There is a literary, it is a literary masterpiece, a magnum opus, a stellar performance, but there's more to the story. The ultimate importance of the Bible lies elsewhere. 
It is the inspired revelation of an almighty God, a heavenly treasure in a world of impoverished ideas, a sparkling mountain stream in the driest of deserts. Our point, however, is not to worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. So this is the foundation. This is like, this is where we start. This is why we have the Bible. It's not to worship the words. It's to worship God. So I had to set that there. My phone is ringing. All right. Now we get into the stuffs. Okay. Old Testament. How did we get it? How did it come about today? So this um, little my table, thank you, Paul, I got from the, one of the guys who was lecturing in the last, the, my last module was I, I had lectures by a guy called Dr. Justin Bass, a young guy, and this is some of his, so the tables that you see today will be from his lectures. So did you know that the Hebrew Bible only had 22 books? And it's called the Tanakh, actually, because the Torah is only the first five books. So that was, that's for free, guys. But what's interesting is it's exactly the same as our Bible, but the reason why there's 22 books is because some of them are combined. So you'll see there's Judges and Ruth are combined, uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and then the Book of 12 is what we would call the Minor Prophets. They all kind of lump together. We have to remember with the Hebrew language, they had no punctuation. Sorry, police grammar wasn't around then. They had no punctuation. They had no gaps. They had no headings. It all flowed. All of that was added in later. So we have to be careful of that. <clears throat> so, so they filed their books differently, if we can say it like that. And um, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. So this is Jose Josephus. He was um, a historian in the time where Jesus was alive, or just after Jesus was alive. So this is what he has to say about the Tanakh, or the, the Hebrew Bible. He says, for we have not had, we have not an innumerable multitude of books among us, among us, disagreeing from and contradicting one another. And then he had to put in, as the Greeks have, but only 22 books. And then from this, he goes and lists all the books that we know of. So there are many, many examples. So what I'm trying to say to you is that there's many examples. By the time Jesus was born, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, was already established, the Old Testament. There was no arguments. I mean, some of the rabbis, I think they were just simply grumpy. They kind of argued about a few of the books, but actually it was well known by this stage. And that's why Josephus was talking. Like, guys, we're not even, it's not contradicting each other. These are the books. They called them sacred writings, and they treated them like such. So the, he, the Old Testament's pretty easy. That's kind of like settled. And it was settled before Jesus was born. So who are we to come and now argue anything about that, right? So this is why our books look different. We've just filed it differently. This is how they kind of label them. Obviously, the Law of Moses or the Torah, historical books, major prophets, minor prophets, and wisdom books. That's how it's kind of viewed as. All right, if you want these tables, I can send them to you. All right, so how, now we get to the New Testament. Now, how reliable is the New Testament? Because now this is an addition to something that was really already well established by then. So John Walton, I like the way he, he said, what he says is like, while the Bible is truly one of a kind, it clearly bears the marks of humankind. Because God chose it that way. I mean, I, if I was God, I personally wouldn't involve us because we make mistakes. But he did. So it would be naive of us not to expect errors coming through because of the human factor. But the question is, were these accidental, these errors or these variants or whatever? Or was it there was there more like intent? Was it, let's say, malicious? Was it purposeful to try and twist the words of God? Great question. So the New Testament have, among the scholars, they talk about these textual variants. In other words, they have disagreements in some of the areas. So any textual variant is in the manuscripts is a variation of the wording. 
word order, um, something that was left out, something that was added, and then spelling differences. Now, if I was a scribe, there would be a lot of spelling errors. So, okay. So, the best guess is that in the textual variants, there's probably between 300,000 to 400,000 of these, let's say, errors amongst all the manuscripts that they, they have. So that sounds quite a lot, right? And then you read that the problem is that there's only 140,000 words in the New Testament itself. So now we have a problem. How does that work? We have seem to have more error than actual <laughs> words, right? So this is actually a very easy one. The reason why there is so many errors is because of the sheer number of manuscripts that we have. If there was one manuscript, there wouldn't simply be any variants or errors because you have nothing to compare it to. However, they have a lot. And I'm going to go into that. And I, when I say a lot, I mean like smarties a lot, a lot. It's really Simple. So if somebody says, yeah, but you have so many errors, you go, you know what? There's because of the amount of manuscripts. And let me tell you how many of the manuscripts we have available to us. Okay, this is a comparison between the New Testament and then all the other manuscripts in the ancient world that were quite important. So have a look. I don't even know that top one. Like, oh, didn't I? What? Oh, but I can't see how to press what button. Oh, cool. So this guy, I don't know who he is. Let's go to Virgil. I've heard Virgil. So he was, that's the time that he was alive. This is now the time elapsed from when he was alive to when the earliest manuscript was written. So there was 900 years space between when the dude was alive and when his writings or what his sayings or his teachings were actually written down. We can't forget the fact that they also lived in an oral tradition. They were dominant oral hearing people, their brains were wired differently to ours. So this does explain some of the, the time lapse. All right. And he has all of eight copies. All right. So let's go to Plato. He, 120 years difference. Oh, uh, good thing I'm not an accountant. <laughs> he had 20 copies that we have. So these are Oh, it's even worse. <laughs> you guys are so glad I'm not doing the church's books. <laughs> All right. Oh, no. All right. Sorry, I'm pressing wrong buttons here. Let's go to Josephus. A thousand years lapse. And he has nine. And he's well regarded as a historian. All right. Julius Caesar's there. Thousand years, ten. You'd think there would be more, huh? All right. So the biggest one that we see is old Homer here. It's five hundred years. So he's the closest to the New Testament, and he has one thousand eight hundred copies, well, manuscripts credited to his name. The New Testament, however, between seventy to one hundred and seventy years from the time that Jesus died that manuscripts started being write, written down. And there's plus 6,000 manuscripts. You read that right. In fact, they, some people say, it's safe to say that they, including the Greek, Latin, and all the different languages, you could have about 20,000 manuscripts from the New Testament alone. So I don't know numbers well, but this is kind of showing that there's something going on here that is beyond human stuff. So the Greek, let's just stick with the Greek. So there's the Greek manuscript. You have to do it with a 5,000, and it's plus. It's not exactly... So today, that we have available to us. So, and some of them are fragmented. Some of them, it's not full books all the time, but they, this is how much evidence they have. 5,600 manuscripts that have survived today. 
There's all together, I'll, this is a big number, 2.6 million pages of text from the New Testament floating around today. That's an astronomical number. I mean, that's big. And the New Testament is literally the best attested, it's like, work of any Greek or Latin literature from the ancient world. I feel like, like mic drop, walk away, kind of. Okay. So you can take photos of these, and then just when people come up to you, you just go, do you want to read some stats? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So the New Testament. So say we didn't have any of those 6,000 to 20,000 manuscripts today. Say that none of them survived. Say that nothing was written down. What are the other testaments that kind of confirm the validity of the New Testament? Well, good thing you asked that. I've got a great answer. So there are a million, over a million quotations from the early church fathers. And between all of those quotes, they could take them all together and re kind of put together the New Testament easily without a single manuscript today. And I'm not even going in, there's other things as well. I'm not even, like what they call external evidences and all that. I'm not even touching that because some of the names are too hard to pronounce. But guys, there is no question. This has been settled. We have, in many ways, there is no argument. Does, like, where did this come from? That's pretty cool. So what are these errors, these disagreements, these variants? So remember that number I said 300,000 to 400,000? 400, okay, don't, don't quote me on my, like my, my numbers. It's all there. <clears throat> so out of that three to 400,000 of errors, 1% is what they consider significant. 1%. So you think of the 6,000 plus manuscripts and the errors in that, of the errors, only 1% of that is something where it's significant. What they consider, this Bible textual scholars consider significant. Okay. The rest are simply, of that three to 400,000, the 99% of that is spelling errors and scribe mistakes. Like if Louise sat down and she was tired and she wrote tree trunk instead of car trunk. You know what I'm saying? And then of that 1%, this is the most important, none of it, none of those errors affect the essential doctrine or core beliefs of the Bible. Guys, process that information. Not one of the errors of the, of the New Testament affect our essential core doctrine or core beliefs of the Bible of the New Testament. In other words, it doesn't contradict anything that God is trying to tell us. None of it. So yes, there's errors. Yes, there's the human factor, but it doesn't f affect what God, God has done. That's pretty cool. All right, so what is the criteria? Like how did they decide? So I'm giving you the details of before you know, we know of like when the canon, they put those rules in place. So a lot of this they include, but this is actually before that kind of, this is in the day of 200 AD when they were like, okay, well, what makes it scripture? What doesn't make it scripture? So this is actually before. Um, so they, they had to, the manuscripts were included or excluded for, for these factors. Was, did they, were there an apostle? Or was it an attributed to one of the early, like the founding apostles? So in other words, Paul knew Peter. So Paul technically wasn't like a 12, he wasn't part of the 12. But, and in fact, Paul's works are the earliest written works. Then it's Mark. Then it's Luke. So they actually, and what's cool is they, um, the next thing is like, okay, when was it written? So how close together, and we saw that stat there, it was between the year 70, so Jesus died in the year around 30, is the year 70 to 170 kind of, 
When was it written? How close to Jesus' lifetime was this manuscript? Or how do we include this book in that? And then there was this, what they call ecclesiastical acceptance. Like of the, these early church fathers, who did they accept? Who didn't they accept? And that's kind of like, they quoted from each other. So I'll give you an example. 1 Timothy 5.18 actually quotes Luke 10.7. So, and there's numerous examples of that in the New Testament where they are quoting from the Gospels or whatever. So you would kind of think if they're quoting it, they would regard it as sacred. And then they have like these external witnesses. Now, I haven't put all the, the, like all the apostolic fathers there because then their names are really odd. So you're talking about people like Justin Martyr, and the reason why his surname is Martyr is because the guy was martyred. Um, Arrhenius, there's a list from Origen. I don't know these guys. And then there's a Sint, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so this guy, he wrote this letter, and he was the first guy to, <laughs> Lee's laughing at me, to, to list all 27 books of the New Testament. So from the very beginning, 22 of the 27 books were never contested. And the others were kind of like, yeah, we're not sure, but it was like three John. Who, so they think some of it was because it either wasn't written or the documents got damaged or whatever. So it wasn't really a major contest. It was just actually probably more anything like what was available. Jude, those kind of books. So they didn't really, I mean, who reads 3 John? Yeah. No, we should though. Don't, it's part of it. Anyway, so by AD 367, all 27 books, so that's a short period of time. 20, all 27 books were listed for the first time and they were all accepted from by then. Like, okay, cool. No one's arguing this point. We're going to carry on. All right, so that's that. There's this guy called Bruce Metz, Metz, Metzger. I, have, I think he's Jewish. Anyway, he's a well-known um, scholar, and uh, he on the New Testament. And he's taught for many years at, like, Princeton. So this guy's good. And he writes in his book, The Canon of the New Testament, he writes this, by the end of the third century, in the beginning of the fourth century, the great majority of the 27 books that still later came to be widely recognized as the canon of that New Testament were most, almost universally acknowledged to be authoritative. So th that's why I'm saying this is before the canon that we know of. And then we get to, you can't do New Testament stuff without quoting something from N.T. Wright. And um, this is from his book, interpretation of the New Testament. So no other ancient writing can, be, can compare with the New Testament in the wealth of it, the evidence, which is what we just looked at, by which it's supported. Only a case of Virgil. There's a name for you guys, if, Maxine, if you're having a boy. Um, is anything like comparison even remotely possible? There is such, and there are such passages, probably there always will be, the astonishing thing is that there are so few. And anyone who reads the New Testament in any one of the half dozen Greek editions or in the modern translations, and here you can settle your anxiety about our modern translations, can feel confident that though there may be some uncertainties in detail in almost everything of importance, so talking about the writer, he, he was very close indeed to the text of the New Testament books as though they were originally written. So you can quote that into your right. So there are debates, but it's peripheral. It's not important. It doesn't take away what Jesus did on the cross. It doesn't take away that God had a plan from the beginning of time that plan was Jesus, and he, needed, he wanted to redeem us because he wants us to be in his family. But I can't just leave you there, hey, because now I've got to give you some guidelines because you guys are going to be excited about studying the Bible. And I know it's hot. I'm sorry. It's actually ESCOM's fault, so I'm not going to apologize. 
But we, we need some guidelines when we come to Bible studying. And guess what? Just because we're not academic or whatever, there is so much information that we can study and learn that in many ways we have no excuses to being biblically ignorant nowadays. And yet, ironically, we're probably the most biblically ignorant in terms of where people are at in the church. So... The churches, unfortunately, what happened with the kind of church and church tradition is it became very narrow. It's like you can't look outside the Bible. You can't, like, read Book of Enoch. You can't, you know, that stuff is, it almost felt like I was a little evil, right? Because it was weird. So, but actually, we need to learn how to think soundly. So, guess what? Reasoning and logic are actually God-given gifts to us. We don't always see it on the roads today, like logic, but anyway, apparently, anyway, I'm not going to go there. So guess what? A sound conclusion draws on all the data. You, for anybody who's been at, in university, you can't just take some data that you prefer or the ones that you like. You've got to now look at all of it and then be able to draw a conclusion. Biblical truths, I love this, aren't islands. Why? Because it imp they are connected and they impact each other. So if this must be true, then what else does that affect and impact? And what does, if that is true, then how does that impact this? So these are the kind of things that you'll, you want to start asking yourself. The problem is we live in an echo chamber called the internet. And Gary said all the stuff that we're dealing with is peer-reviewed. The internet is not peer-reviewed. Please don't go and read a blog on some random guy who is delivering all his opinions and making it sound like that's a sound argument. Be very careful. It's, it's, the internet's literally designed to be an echo chamber. So you've got to be careful who you read. If the guy is not peer-reviewed, which means there are other people in his industry that have checked his stuff, then be careful. Because those guys can sound really amazing, but actually they're just sprouting off other straw man arguments where it's just literally nothing, or they just attack people. Be careful of the so-called Christian who attacks everyone in Christian realm because they don't agree with them. Be careful. We shouldn't be giving those guys any room to, to say the things that they do. And it's actually terribly, horribly sad that our Christians, our brothers and sisters are attacking each other and the world looks on and goes, so much for brotherly love. And the internet is ripe with that. So don't go down those rabbit holes. It's not healthy and it's, it really doesn't reflect God's heart. We can disagree, but we don't attack. So, it's interesting that you can have two points that are true and yet still be in tension, opposition to each other. So guess what? God is unique. He's amazing. He's uncreated, eternal God of, God of gods. But there is, still doesn't make it true that there are other gods, other Elohim. Both can be there, both can be true. It doesn't negate one from the other because the Hebrews mindset or the ancient world are able to hold truths and tension and we should learn to do that as well. <clears throat> so biblical sound thinking needs to follow a series of connected steps to reach a point of conclusion. If one of those steps becomes kind of cancels it out, then you've got to go, okay, well, maybe my steps are following the wrong pathway. You can't start with an end conclusion and then find the steps to, to fit your path, you know, your end conclusion. And that's what we often do. Well, I like this idea much better than that idea. So now I'm going to find stuff in the Bible that, agree, that agrees with me. That is, not, that is not sound thinking and that's not valid. So our biggest challenge that we have is that we have access to so much information because we live in the information age, but we're not able to properly process the information. Because literally, it's not even every day. It's like things are changing, almost feels like by the hour. 
So you just get lumped with this idea and lumped with that idea and lumped with this, and we are not able to process correctly and properly and connect them all because we're just getting bombarded. We have to learn to step back from that and process properly what God is saying, how he's saying it, and why he's saying it. So I want to caution you in this series be very careful not to jump to any conclusions because remember we are going to take we are taking connected steps and we are taking you through a journey to get to a place along the way you are going to be going wait what but that's not what i thought so don't reach conclusions in those places in those preachers Come and speak to us, ask us questions. So the conclusion you don't want to get through is like, oh, well, everything about the Bible is wrong now and give up. Don't do that. Because that obviously leads you to a place of hopelessness and hopelessness is never found in God. You can trust the Bible. So some things are secure. Like God is love. God is eternal. God is uncreated. Jesus died for you. You camp in the security of the things that you do know while trying to process how that fits the uncertainties that may come up. So you stay in the certainty of who God is, his faithfulness. Okay, so that's, that's what, how we're going to do this. And it's, I've been on this journey, I don't know, a few years so I've been studying for the last two years on this, but before that I was reading and processing in that. So it's going to take time, and you are going to go, wait, what? And ask questions, and that's okay. We understand that. We want you to. So we have to allow or let the Bible be what it is. It's not a science textbook. We cannot fit the Bible into our traditions, what we think is traditional church our prejudice as South Africans or Western thinkers or our culture, what we think it should be right or wrong. You know what? God didn't ever demand the biblical writers to be something that they weren't. He didn't say, right, guys, well, you living in a culture that has slavery, that is wrong. So guess what? I'm going to change your worldview before I allow you to write. He didn't do that. Just because the Bible mentions slaveries and that Hebrews had slaveries does not mean he endorsed it or ever did. He prepared, he equipped every writer for the task that he called them to. It's called providence. And again, he never demanded them to change their ideas about where they lived, their culture, their worldview. And he literally told everything that he wanted to tell that was important to him through the Holy Spirit, through these writers. And we have to be, we have to trust in that. Okay. John Walton again. The Bible is fresh and speaks to each one of us as God's revelation of himself in a very confusing, well, confusing world. I think when he wrote this, it was confusing. Now it's very confusing. It is ours, and at times it feels quite personal. But we cannot afford to let this idea run away with us. The Old Testament does communicate to us, and it was written for us, and for all of humankind. But it was not written, uh, sorry, it was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. It was written to Israel. And it's God's revelation of himself to Israel so that they can also reveal who he is through them. A kind of, and that's our job. God re, we found the revelation of who God is and we reveal that to others through his word. Did I make sense there? Okay. So he prompted them to tell his truths. And... Everything that he chose to put in there is important to him. There's some stories and some things that did came away, like sacrifices and stuff. But there was a reason for telling those stories, and we're going to unpack that. Guess what? They used the environment. 
They even used literary techniques that you see in Mesopotamia and Babylon, <gasps> shock and skunder, to tell their story. Why? Because he was comfortable because he chose the time period. He's the true creator, we aren't. So truth, God's truth, transcends culture, our culture, our modern mindset. And it does reflect, like I said, the surrounding culture. And we do need to be open because we are the Westerners with a Greek mindset. And that is what it is in some ways, that some stuff from the supernatural realm in the Bible or even other subjects might be real, real even though it's super weird to us. Like when we're going to mention the watches and the Nephilim and these guys and how demons were actually, how demons came about. It's weird. It's weird to think that there was this merging of a supernatural demigod who now then took a wife, had sex with her, and then they produced offspring. Our brains, like, and there are going to be times when we're going to bring in brooms and you guys are going to just have to sweep up the parts of your brain and then we'll just, like, okay, guys, we'll chat next week. That's how I felt. <laughs> Allow the supremacy of scripture over the tradition of science. So guess what? The origins and the source of scripture is Holy Spirit. So 2 Timothy 3.16, that says where scripture is God-breathed. That's not talking about the process of how scripture came into being. It's talking about the origins, the source of scripture. It's divine through Holy Spirit, but written by men. God chose humans to play a role. He's God, we are not. His goals were achieved and he was satisfied. Because guess what? He was satisfied what was conveyed was what he wanted to say. Our job is to try and figure out what God is saying through that. <clears throat> and again, we can't assume that, especially when you come to like Genesis and people try and unpack it in a scientific way, it actually gets quite amusing because it wasn't written as a scientific literature. It was an origin literature from a deity and the origins of humans within a relationship to their deity. I don't know where my picture disappeared. So, there was a, so this is where we, we, we see the tendency of Scripture to become where we have some issues nowadays, right? So remember that of that 1%, none of it is, will deal like messes with the doctrine and the essential core beliefs, all right? So keep that there. But there was a tendency for translators to make mistakes and then the next ones would copy those mistakes. It's like instead of, you know, copy and paste, copy and paste, and then you just copy and paste the error, and you can copy and paste the formatting wrong. I don't know if you've ever done that. That's very irritating. So this is kind of how it happens. So this is where I want to, I'm going to blow very gently your nativity Christmas tradition a little bit up. Okay. So Luke 2 verse 7, it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. What do you, when you read that, what do you guys think? I think nativity scene. You know, when, and I've been saying to Gary, oh, we need to go and buy like a nativity scene. Our old one, I think we've got Jesus, baby Jesus left in that like wooden thing. We've got Mary, maybe a shepherd, and some cows left, like the rest is either broken or disappeared or gone. The actual wooden stables pff, fallen apart. So our nativity scene needs to be replaced. But now I'm rethinking this, and this is the reason why. Maybe there's artists here who can recreate a proper nativity scene for us. So that word in was a translation error. <clears throat> and it came about because it went from I think it was St. Jerome who learned Hebrew and then he rewrote the whole um, Bible 
everything included, even the kind of apocryphal thing, although he was very grumpy about that. He didn't want to include that, but he was forced to. And he translated that into Latin. And that translation was kind of the, almost like the, like the, the, the top-notch translation for a thousand years. And then William Tyndale, is that how you pronounce it? He translates that Latin translation into German. So between the Hebrew, the Latin, and the German, that word in somehow got messed up. And if you want more of the detail, I can go into it with that with you. That Hebrew word doesn't mean in. So we think that Paul, Mary, and Joseph were sitting around, like huddled around in this wooden hut, all alone, but there were some like wise men hanging around and the shepherds were kind of watching. Angels were like singing in the sky and then, then there was a star. That's kind of what you think, eh? am I right? That's what you think when you think of the Christmas story. It actually wasn't like that at all, but it doesn't change the story. So this is what I mean. So the Hebrew word in should be translated into guest room. Guess what? Mary and Joseph were not isolated from their family. They were staying in the family home because they were all, remember, they were all told they had to leave their home and go back to, there was some census and like number, I don't know, even like people counting, peoples. You know, when we do that stupid thing before, before you vote kind of thing. So they had their version of that. So everyone had to go home. So the family guest space was filled so they stayed in the house. So in those days, the houses, I should have downloaded a picture for you, were actually almost like a two-story building. So the, there was like a dugout lower ground building where they, they, and it was almost always at a, a bit of a level. So they had, that's where they cooked their family meals and like, what are you saying, Gary? Did I say, okay, I'm not an architect. <laughs> Chloe, don't. <laughs> so, so they kind of, and then on one section of this big family room where they used to spend time and cook and eat and like your living room basically, there was a small section where they allowed some of your sick animals and then at night some of the animal, animals used to come in. So guess what? There were cows and there were sheep. And the manger wasn't made out of wood. It was actually a stone carved manger that was kind of in that room too. So the reason... And they don't know why Mary and Joseph had to stay there. But they weren't kicked out of an inn and they weren't like rejected. They were just, I think probably what happened, because she was pregnant and they had to travel over a few days. Maybe they just arrived later than everybody else. <laughs> so maybe the family was upset that she was pregnant. Because remember, she was supposed to be a virgin. So maybe there was a little bit of, mm, you guys are being naughty but they didn't kick them out and they weren't alone. The family was there. It's just that the upstairs bedrooms were all full. So they, she gave birth downstairs in the family room with the family around her. She had midwives. Hey, I can't hear you. With the animals. And I think even the, the, the like three wise men, I think they only came through like two years later. And the shepherds probably weren't on that very night right there, this poor woman. Can you imagine? Like, hey, guys, you know, we're coming to have a look. No, I'm sure it didn't happen like that. Timelines were different. <laughs> so the point of that is that even though our traditional view of Christmas is probably quite off, it's off in a cultural context. It doesn't change the point of the story. And the point of the story is Jesus born supposedly a king, he wasn't born in a palace. He was born in an inconvenient place at an inconvenient time for the family. So, in all this, one of my last things is we need to raise our expectations of Scripture, actually, not lower them. But it's because we have to rethink how we look at the Bible, how we process the information. We need to enter into their world, and there is lots of information about how that world actually existed. We cannot impose our meaning onto the text because that's how we gain clarity is if we understand more, and it's just a little bit of information. 
I don't want you all to feel overwhelmed, like, oh, we're not scholars, what are we going to do? Because we have that amazing ability through people like Michael Heiser, John Walton, N.T. Wright, where they are explaining this stuff to us so that we can understand it. And guess what? It opens up the most incredible deep experience of reading the Bible. Again, it's almost as if you're reading it for the first time. And you understand even more so what Jesus has done. So yes, there is an impact of translations, but it doesn't affect the core. Ironically, we have access to more of the original stuff and more of the source culture than what the early church fathers did. And the reality is, guys, it takes time and effort. So, the importance of context. Context is king. <laughs> I've read a few of the scholars who say this. Michael Heiser, I think John Walton, and there was another guy called Andrew Bartlett. Con context is king. Why? Because words don't mean anything by themselves. They are only make sense when they're put into the context that they're used. Actually, language has to make sense only in a culture context. Because we can say trunk, and as South Africans we'll think of an elephant trunk or tree trunk, the Americans are going to think of a car trunk. Dictionaries, the, the lexicons, which is another, it's like a fancy word for like an ancient dictionary, they are useful tools, but we have to be careful that we don't cherry pick the meanings to suit what we like. Again, you're reading the, let's say a letter of Paul, you're reading it in context of what he is saying to his audience, not to you, and what he's addressing, and they're going to have a flow, an argumental flow. That they, and Paul was amazing. He was a literary genius. He was careful and thoughtful about how he was going to use his illustrations to bring across the points. But he's not going to use illustrations that we understand. We have to understand what he was trying to say. Don't feel overwhelmed. It takes a little bit of work, but it is valuable and we can do it. So the important question is not does, what does this little individual word mean? And I've done this, where you take a Hebrew word and you're like, oh, it says this, but actually it's not. About, there's so much more to it. So what does the author mean to say when he uses that word in the context of all the other words that he's using? Sometimes Paul takes a word that he never uses, and he uses it only in a specific context. But then you've got to find out why. What is he trying to convey? What message is he saying? So Bible study takes time. Context makes the determination, not the list of possible meanings in a dictionary. We don't treat the Bible or words like a dictionary. We treat it like an encyclopedia. There's so much more about this than what we go in. So you can rest. I want you to process what I'm saying to you today. Maybe listen to it again because you can rest and be secure that the Bible is what it says it is. There is mountains of evidence that prove that, and it hasn't changed. Yes, we've gotten some bits and pieces wrong. The new NIV has taken some really courageous decisions in changing some of their translations. That word in, they were one of the first to change it to guest room. So they, they I mean, tr church tradition in Bible translations can be very strong. Especially when they think, well, the Latin was the most. No, the Hebrew and the Greek but you can rest. So here's a cool image before you all fall asleep from heat exhaustion. Have you seen this on the internet? So it's beautiful, but it's incredible what it means. So each of those little arcs and like lines, <clears throat> all 63,779 are cross references in the Bible. So basically these guys, a pastor, Christoph, that guy, and, uh, and uh, I thought he was an artist, but actually Chris Harrison is a computer science professor person. And they have taken all the cross-references in the Bible that are linked, basically in other words, either the word is linked 
or they've quoted or whatever. There's 63,779 that these guys found, one guy found. Do you think that God is in something in the Bible? Do you think Holy Spirit has done something? Considering there were 44 authors, okay? Four, over 40 authors, different languages, and we still get this. That is incredible. Okay, so that's like this foundational, hopefully I've cemented some stuff. Hopefully you're kind of feeling, <sighs> okay, that's really good. And some people take time processing that. That's also okay. So what's next? So now we're going to start dealing with the spiritual, spiritual realm or the supernatural realm. And I should have like music going in the background. Now we're going to be asking the question, what does the Bible really say about the supernatural realm? Not our tradition, not our head, not our Western mind thinking. And then I've put in this verse, and I've just, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on his right and on his left. And if you want to find out more, come next week. Gary's going to happen that. To be continued.